morning, friends. It's great to be with you this Monday morning. I want to encourage you, grab your hot coffee, grab your hot tea, whatever it is you like to get going this morning, and let's dive into God's Word together. Today, we're looking at the crucifixion of Jesus. We've been tracking through Luke chapter 23, this last part of the Passion Week, this last part of what Jesus did on the cross as he was finishing up his work here on the earth. So I want to encourage you this morning, as we do every day, if you have any prayer requests this morning, please type those in to the comment section. And if you see a prayer request come across, be sure to reply. And also, also, if you're tracking with us on the podcast version, you can always email us at biblecast at tfc.org. As you can tell, we're not home. Kim and I are down here in South Lake, Texas, about to drive up to McKinney uh, to keep doing our work on NOTA, our digital discipleship app. So I would love it if you guys would be praying for us today. We sure would uh, appreciate that for safe travels, but also just that we would be pressing in, getting the wisdom of the Lord as we continue to move that project forward. All right, here we go. As we're looking at the crucifixion of Jesus, this is really just an incredible story for us to see here. Let's verse 13. Here we go. Pilate gathered the people together with the high priest and all the religious leaders of the nation and told them, you have presented this man to me and charged him with stirring a rebellion among the people. But I say to you that I have examined him here in your presence and have put him on trial. My verdict is that none of the charges you have brought against him are true. I find no fault in him. Now, this is an amazing thing that we see here from Pilate. Pilate is the one who was the really one responsible for trying Jesus. He's the one that is ultimately responsible for condemning him to death. And yet, when he uh, does a complete examination of Jesus, he's talked to Jesus, he is engaged with him. We know that uh, his wife has had a dream. One of the other Gospels tells us that his wife's had a dream. So he even has a little bit of supernatural input from his wife. And he can't find any fault with Jesus. And this is really significant because it lets us know that Jesus, our Savior, truly was innocent. The charges, the trumped up charges that have been brought against him by the religious leaders, these are the wrong charges. They're just they're just totally made up. And so Pilate, when he examines the situation, uh, totally realizes that no, there is no, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing to charge him with. He says, and I have this, continuing in verse 15, and I sent him to Antipatus, son of Herod who also, after questioning him, has found him not guilty. Since he has done nothing deserving death, I decided to punish him with a severe flogging flogging, and release him. For it was Pilate's custom to honor the Jewish holiday, remember at the Jewish Passover, by releasing a prisoner. Okay, so now we know what has happened here. And Luke really does spare us many of the details. Some of the other gospels go into great detail. But we know what's happened to Jesus. So Jesus was taken before Pilate. Pilate turned him over to Antipatus. We saw this last week. This was Herod Antipatus. Jesus was uh, found innocent there. Uh, He comes before Pilate, found innocent there. And so what Pilate did to try to appease the people is he had Jesus whipped. And so this was a terrible thing that happened to Jesus. He would have had a whip that had metal and glass shavings uh, in the end of the whip. He would have been flogged. Uh, We know that he was flogged really literally just within inches of his own death. So his back would have been in shreds as he took the whippings Uh, And and I love what it says, and Isaiah says, by his stripes we are healed. You know, Jesus took the punishment upon himself. He literally had the stripes on his back that were there because of our healing, so that we could be saved, so that we can be healed, so that we can have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything Jesus took upon himself, all of the destruction, all of uh, uh, of just the, the, the brutality of what the Romans had to offer, so that we might walk in the fullness of the healing that we have. And of course, as we know, and (laughs) I got a little ahead of myself, we'll see it tomorrow as uh, he makes his way to the cross. And so let's continue. Let me back up to verse 17 again. It says, for it was Pilate's custom to honor the Jewish holiday by releasing a prisoner. So it says that he would every year, he would release a prisoner and uh, and, and it was just normally a thing that he would do is he would come up and say, okay, who can I send back to you? Because Rome was often arresting folks, especially troublemakers and, and folks that were uh, affecting the crowds and getting crowds stirred up and that sort of thing. So they didn't want any of that uh, sort of rebellion to happen. And so uh, Pilate just thought, okay, it's my custom to release one. I'm going to release Jesus and that's going to make you happy. Now, Pilate also was clearly tracking with the life of Jesus. He knew how popular Jesus was among the people, etc. But then in verse 18, it says, when the crowd heard this, when they heard that Pilate was going to release Jesus, they went wild. 
erupting with anger, they cried out, No, take this one away and release Barabbas. For Barabbas had been thrown in prison for robbery and murder. Now, there were two, uh, th these were two men, two sons. Barabbas means son of a father. Now, this is fascinating. Barabbas means son of a father. And of course, Jesus was the son of our heavenly father. And the son of Adam, um, uh, the, the one was the son of Adam. Barabbas was the son of Adam. His sin came through Adam. The other was the son of God. And so it's very interesting that his name there is even something that really helps us to, to understand what was going on. So the son of the father, you know, the son of, of Adam was being released while Jesus, the son of God, was being sent to be crucified. And this is a perfect picture of what Jesus did for us. The one who was a robber and a murderer, the one who clearly deserved punishment, the one who clearly deserved death, the one who clearly deserved to go to the cross, the one who clearly was the one that was guilty in the eyes of everyone. And you know, it, Pilate knew it, everybody knew it, the crowd knew it. He's the one that goes free. When Jesus, the one that's been declared innocent, the one that has been declared uh, at completely guilt-free, the one that has already received the punishment. Now that's something to see here. Barabbas hadn't been flogged, but here Jesus had been flogged. He'd been, he'd been whipped, his back beat to shreds, just so that he could take on the punishment for all of us. This is a, an incredible picture of the redemptive work of what Jesus did, the way he took on himself what we ourselves deserve. So verse 20, Pilate wanting to release Jesus tried to convince them it was best to let Jesus go. But they cried out over and over, crucify him, crucify him. Now, we know that the, 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 priest, the priest, the religious leaders had stirred up the crowd to do this. A third time, Pilate asked the crowd, what evil crime has this man committed that I should have him crucified? I haven't found one thing that warrants a death sentence. I will have him flogged severely and then release him. But the people and the high priest, shouting like a mob, screamed out at the top of their lungs, no, crucify him, crucify him. Finally, their shouts and screams succeeded. Pilate caved into the crowd in order that the will of the people be done. Then he released the guilty murderer Barabbas as they had insisted and handed Jesus over to be crucified. And we'll pick up that story again then tomorrow in verse 26 there. But here we just see this incredible activity, this incredible picture taking place not in front of the religious leaders, but in, even in front of the Roman leaders, in front of Pilate, where he examines Jesus and he finds Jesus to be completely innocent. And he knows that Barabbas is guilty. He offers up to let Jesus go. And yet the crowd wanted Barabbas. And so Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, he takes on himself the punishment that was due us. And quite literally, I, I love again that, that name Barabbas that means son of the father. He literally was of the descendant of Adam, one that had the original sin, one that was connected to that tree of sin. And yet Jesus, the one that was the son of our heavenly father, the one that was innocent and free, is the one that gets crucified in our stead. You know, it's, this is the gospel right here. This is the perfect picture of the gospel, how Jesus took on himself the punishment that we all deserve. Not that, not that, uh, uh, that, that he did anything wrong himself, but he, had, he took on the complete punishment for us. So this morning, Father, as we come to you and we remember what Jesus did, we see this incredible gesture that has taken place. We see what has happened here. Father, we're just so thankful for who Jesus is. We're thankful that he took upon himself all of the guilt, all of the shame. He took the beatings that we deserved. He took the, the, the pain that should have been ours. And Father, he willingly did it. We're going to see this so much more in the, in the coming days here. But he so did it willingly, knowing that he was doing it for us, knowing that that cup that he had prayed for, that cup of wrath that he had prayed for in the garden was here and he was willing to drink it. He was willing to take all of that on himself because of his love for us. So Father, thank you for the grace. Thank you for the freedom and thank you for the love that we get to share because of what Jesus has done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. We pray that you guys have an amazing day. We love y'all. We love y'all. God bless you guys.